Dear guests and dear participants, thank you for being here and uh, sorry for being a little bit late. I can confirm that we are going to have our um, buzz in the front between 5 and 5.15. As I called them earlier, I cannot say a precise time. I'm sorry, Jens. I know that you like precision, but it's not possible right now. So um, because they, they are coming and getting traffic, it's, it's before time. Um, as I've told you, we are going to finish very informally because of the situation of not having our president here for health reasons. But there is no reason why we couldn't finish as friends, as colleagues, as uh, fellows in religious liberty uh, defense and promotion. And uh, first of all, um, I would like to appreciate the presence of, uh, I would say, a dear friend of the religious communities and of freedom in Portugal. Um, we also had something to offer our commemorative medal of the 75th anniversary of the IDLR to Gulbenkian and also to the I Commissioner for Migrations. But in fact, we saved one. We thought it was important for everybody to acknowledge the presence of the person who wrote the Portuguese religious liberty law. He received an award last year uh, in Portugal uh, for his work and his life defending the freedom of religions, uh, the religion and, and belief. But um, it's not only because uh, he is awarded, it's because I personally need that people from other countries acknowledge his presence. He's, he was a justice, he's still a justice of the Constitutional Court. His name is José de Souza Brito. And he was uh, the president of the commission that was entitled to have the, um, the, the project of the religious liberty law. And in fact, he studied different laws. He tried to frame a legal frame in Portugal. I know that uh, our friends from Portugal and Spain appreciate him a lot. And I would like to ask Conselheiro Sousa Brito to come here. And our vice president, Asher Maos, is going to give a medal from IDLR to uh, Conselheiro Sousa Brito. Thank you for your presence uh, in our midst. Uh, many of you had the opportunity to talk with Conselheiro Sousa Brito, which is an inspiration to each person that has that opportunity. Uh, we also wish to thank, before giving uh, the final word to Ganun Diop and Adam Adiang, we'd like to thank the people that made this possible. It's uh, very important that we, first of all, acknowledge Gulbenkian. Gulbenkian was very important in, in, in giving us this space. Uh, we were treated wonderfully. They helped us in the organization. They helped us in all the protocol. They were ready to support us even in health issues like now that was needed. So Gulbenkian is um, a very respected foundation in Portugal, but they are at the same time so respectful to the people that they, they host, and I have to thank everybody. First of all, they will receive something I will not call everybody here, that's not necessary, but the people from the sound and media that made a huge work in uh, helping us to have the conditions that we have. So thank you uh, for, for those people that we don't see, but it's important that you know. We also would like to acknowledge our two translators that worked for full days uh, in Portuguese and in English. Thank you. Gisela and Teresa. It's important that we say the name of people when we know them. Gisela and Teresa. Thank you so much for your, for your work. We have something for them. Yes, you, you can give them. I'm not going to call. You also are going to receive something, okay? Um, also, I don't know if she's... Um, 
Uh, right there now, I don't think so. The PR from Gulbenkian, Francisca uh, Vasconcelos, she worked a lot during these days. The chief of protocol, Dr. Tavora, they were amazing in helping us and uh, we have to thank them too and we will properly when we leave. But uh, there are some people from our team that I would like to highlight. Joel Calado, the photographer, worked full day, two full days taking pictures of her. Thank you, Joel, for, for that. Along with Rafael Nagler from the Switzerland chapter. Where is he? Thank you so much, Rafael, who has been working with us. Um, the transportation people are not here, of course, because they are taking people from and on the airport. Bruno, you are here. So someone is going to lose the flight now. OK. Bruno Caixeiro and Pedro, they, they were very useful. Thank you, Bruno, because you were coming and back and forth. Um, and uh, of course, we always think about people that uh, come here in front, that talk, that make the presentations. But there were three people really important in this organization. They were from the first point. Uh, from the first moment working with me, and I have to uh, appreciate them in a special manner. Uh, Pedro Torres from France, he was uh, responsible for all communication, interviews, articles, communication with you. Pedro, you need to come here, please. And Mercedes, Mercedes will give you something. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you so much for your work. No, no, you, you are not going to talk. I'm sorry. Oh. I know you want. It's just to receive the present. Keanu is going to be upset if I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ezequiel Duarte, the Secretary General from Portugal. And uh, we wouldn't be able to, 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 to do the meeting here without his efforts and his team. And thank you for taking care of all the logistics. Thank you, Ezequiel. <laughs> Of course, I won't ask Mercedes to offer this to, him, to herself, but you all know how, um, how much Mercedes has worked. Uh, she has been in contact with us, working with the hotel, the transportation, taking care of the tickets. And uh, for me, it was really easy to organize a conference with her because all the merit is on the logistic work. Mercedes, thank you so much. We appreciate it. So thank you for um, being present in our conference. I'm sorry for taking this moment to appreciate people, but we need to appreciate them because they turn, they make all this possible. I would like to invite Ganun Diop to come here and to have some words from Mila, our mother association. Uh, every once in a while, I disagree with Paolo. And this is one of those because I, told him this is not necessary, but he wanted me to say some words. Um, you are very gracious, really, uh, Paolo. But let me say two things. One is uh, I really have hope to see people like you. You know, they are, uh, uh, and I sometimes explain that in my work, I see the worst of humanity sometimes, but I also see the best. And I can say that you are among the best, focusing on improving people's lives, being an asset to other people. I mean, reflecting on themes like freedom um, to help people live better lives. So I want to thank each one of you for your commitment to our common humanity. Uh, and I think that's just beautiful. And that's your best gift of yourself to the whole human family. Uh, my apology to finish on a very light note, but Paolo is also very gracious. I don't understand how is it that you could give an award for someone who stole my 10 minutes, uh, whose name is Pedro. I don't understand that. <laughs> but anyway, let's just say grace is also extended to the worst of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, but really, from, from the heart, and uh, Paolo knows that he can always uh, count, uh, count on our unconditional support. 
thank you for all that you do to make this world a better place. Thank you so much. Um, finally, I would like to invite our president of the honorary committee to have the final word to close this conference. Thank you, Mr. Adam Adiang, to be for being with us, my brother. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you in person. We didn't have the opportunity, but you have been so, so helpful and kind with us during all this mandate until now, and I would like you to invite you to close the session. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. You thank everyone around, and it is my turn to thank you. I think uh, this uh, conference would not have been a success without you. You were at the beginning, and definitely you will be also at the end, and the end being a success, the end hopefully becoming your legacy. Because by deciding to uh, invite us here in Lisbon uh, to uh, discuss uh, such an important uh, issue. As I said yesterday, the issue of freedom of religion and freedom of expression is the issue of our time. And uh, if I may venture, a common thread that uh, runs through all discussion over the last two days. It is that the violations of religion, religious liberties and thought, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, is not only an injustice, but it is a pernicious weed that slowly but surely shocks off opportunities for living peacefully together. The despair of people living in countries where these uh, fundamental rights are neglected is a powerful and volatile force. It has led violent crackdowns and bloodshed. Just as generations of leaders have subscribed it, uh, uh, to the maxim, if you want peace, prepare war. Recent events, I propose, merit a revision of this tired and worn out adage. Today, I would point to those same leaders in the direction of the many ongoing conflicts and say to them, if you want peace, protect religious freedom, protect freedom of expression. At the opening of the, this conference, I challenged all of us present here to come up with a stringent and clear message on the significance of religious liberty and freedom of expression in our world in turmoil. You welcomed and accepted this challenge as reflected in the excellent and enlightening discussions we have had over the past two days. I have seen brilliant and passionate minds engaging with and meeting this challenge. Two of them in front of me, and uh, Dean Machado, once again, thank you very much for your remarkable presentation. And at this point uh, in the conference, most of the discussions, the speeches, are behind us. You have grappled with these issues energetically and forcefully. Perhaps at this point, you are a little tired. Perhaps the conclusions of my remarks is all that stands between you and I wish a few days of well-deserved rest and relaxation. Why not? 
in this beautiful country, which I invite you to visit as tourists. But unfortunately, I would not, I would like nothing more to conclude my remarks here by congratulating you on a job well done. Except, unfortunately, I cannot do that. I cannot simply congratulate you for what you did. You did a remarkable work these two days. In fact, having spoken with many of you over the course of this conference, I know that you possess that particular personality trait of the optimist, never content when the stakes are this high, to rest on your laurels and say, I have done enough. Because I have seen this in you, rather than just pat you on your back, I will again challenge you. Challenge you to have the courage to take the extra step and take back home with you for further discussion and implementation, not only the ideas, messages, uh, that are easy to accept, but also the novel ideas messages and projects. Novel ideas are the one we have witnessed, we have heard from the Commissioner of Migration. And I could not but fully concur with uh, our American uh, colleagues who was the last to speak today when she said as a jet traveler, she can say that what uh, the Portuguese have done she hasn't seen it in any airport around the world, and I do also conquer. But I would like also to say that those national chapters of the AIDL are here present. You have a big challenge because it will be very important that you take stock of what we have discussed it these last two days, and to see how you can translate it into concrete action once you are back home. And for those who are in Switzerland, you are lucky having Ibrahim Salama around there, and you can count on his support. But even those who are not in Switzerland, Ibrahim will always be available uh, to uh, share with you his knowledge, his experience towards contributing towards the implementation of your ideas so that you can further promote and protect freedom of religion and freedom of expression. My dear friends, all of us, of course, want and strive uh, for continued successes but none of us should be afraid to fail in the process of achieving those successes. The size of the challenges we will face are no reason to become disheartened. Rather, they are a reason to be emboldened. We learn from uh, past setbacks, we apply those lessons, and we get closer to the ideal. Ibrahim was reminding me two words of the Quran about failure. I didn't know about it, but it looks like learn from failures of the past. And I think that is extremely important. And uh, we, as I said, learn from past setbacks. And as the Irish uh, playwriter Samuel Beckett wrote, try again, fail again, fail better. Faced with a momentary failure, 
it is not your expectation of greatness that should change, but the methods to achieve that greatness that must adapt. We know that we labor in a field where our job is never done, will never be done. There is no trophy to take home to show that you have won it all. There are only degrees of more or less justice. We will never leave this world perfect for our children and our children's children. But we can leave it better than we found it for the next generation to take up the cause as our predecessors did and to carry forth the flame. We can do it, and I'm proud standing in this uh, trip to uh, remember the work of uh, our first honorary president, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was part of the US delegation, part of those who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When she said that, Human rights start at home, at small places one cannot even see in a map of the world. And that is exactly the message we should carry on, each of us, starting from within our own home. And I say that uh, one wise man have said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And I feel that I can speak uh, confidently on this principle because this is one uh, of whose breach I face the consequences of every day in my work at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, in my work as special advisor on the prevention of genocide the international community catastrophically compromised its duty to prevent mass atrocities and genocide when it failed the Bosnian Muslim in Srebrenica, the Yazidis in Iraq, the Muslim Rohingya in Myanmar, the Christian Chaldean, and the ongoing treatment of the Uyghur in China. These are examples which amply justify our recommitment to defending religious liberty and remain in constant vigilance. The type of vigilance that was so sorely lacking in all those places I mentioned. And the list is not exhaustive. The type of vigilance that I'm hopeful you and I will apply in order to contribute an effective respect of religious liberty and freedom of expression. Renew vigilance, renew courage, and renew dedication. We as concerned members of the global community, as individuals committed to justice and human rights, as experts in our fields must pledge our most fearless engagement and our most productive cooperation in order to make sure that where persons are still suffering injustice, we do our utmost to prevent and resolve those conditions. We owe it to the victims of the violations of religious liberty and freedom of expression. We owe it to ourselves. Let's remind the political leaders, the religious leaders, and faith-based actors, let's remind all in position of power that whenever we compromise with our fundamental values just to accommodate our immediate comfort, our short-sighted interests, this always come back to haunt us. For instance, just remember that weapons and ammunition provided to unscrupulous Afghans by Americans, 
to support their fight against the Russian invaders ended up being turned against US soldiers some decades later. It was certainly fine to support the just cause of Afghan people, but it was more questionable to rely on persons who set little store by the human basic values. The Afghan are still suffering, and particularly the girls and the women. You go to Afghanistan, freedom of expression is being violated. You cannot speak freely. You go to Iran, we have seen it recently. Freedom of expression was also being violated. So what can we do, brothers and sisters? We all agree that education to tolerance and respect for diversity is the key to prevention. Prevention, however, is often confronted by fanaticism, passion, and ambition of individuals. But fortunately, we know that educated people and sensitized people know how to set themselves as a bulwark to defend their values. Let us therefore act together to make our common values triumph. This is also the message behind the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together, a document signed in Abu Dhabi on 4 February 2019 by His Holiness Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Dr. Ahmed Al-Tayyeb. The aspiration of these two leaders is that their declaration constitute an invitation to reconciliation and fraternity among all believers, indeed, among believers and non-believers. That's the Pope and the Grand Imam. So that means the non-believers, the atheists, are our brothers and sisters. And I'm glad that uh, when we were promoting the plan of action for religious leaders, Ibrahim Salama and I, we involve it, the association of the artists. Because at the end of the day, we have to bear in mind that we are one world, one humanity. But uh, what is also important is that these two religious leaders acknowledge that uh, freedom is a right of every person, that each individual enjoys the right to freedom of belief, thought, expression, and action. They went further to state that the pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. This divine wisdom is the source from which the right to freedom of belief and the freedom to be different derives. Therefore, the fact that people are forced to adhere to a certain religion or culture must be rejected. It is my firm conviction that both the Pope and the Grand Imam share the same values we all here are cherishing, and which are respect for life, respect for difference. And it is at this price that we can watch a hideous past with full conviction that it will not repeat itself. While we cannot correct the mistakes of the past, we can at least <coughs> learn from them and strive to create mechanisms that can help us prevent such violations of freedom of religion and freedom of expression happening again.
It is not an easy task. It is one that requires a dedicated commitment and a political will. And it is such a commitment and such a political will which will back our quest for a better world marked by respect for cultural diversity of peoples and nations, a world from which any form of discrimination will reign, a world of respect for the right to be different. When we talk about the dialogue of religions and culture, the most common error is to reduce it to a theatrical uh, protagonism where everyone could come and read their script. But to my view, the only true dialogue is that of taking a seat in what another president, honorary president of the AIDLR stated, and I'm referring here to the first president of Senegal, President Leopold Sedar Senghor, he called that dialogue le banquet de l'universel. I mean, the table where you will have everyone around that table. So therefore, enriching each order from our own religion, from our own belief, from our own culture. Your culture is not more beautiful than mine. My God is not more beautiful than yours. So we have to make sure that when I look on you in your through your eyes, that I see myself and vice versa. And that is why when uh, concluding a discussion with the late Cardinal Toran at the Vatican, we concluded that the most serious threat to our planet is not what Huting Tong theorized, the clashes of civilization, but it is rather the clashes of ignorances. We need to know each other better. And if we undertake that daily exercise, we will certainly end by living in a world where we will no longer have a problem with freedom of religion, with freedom of expression. The action of the AIDLR does not necessarily make the headlines, but it remains essential. Sometimes it is at the cost of its discretion that it gains in efficiency. That said, it is very useful from time to time we take a short break to look around, to take a closer look at our mission for peace. In this hypermediatic world where the degree of interest uh, can be granted by the media is not necessarily proportional to the importance of the activity. We must congratulate ourselves on having forum like this, which brought us together these, two last, these last two days. And I'm hopeful that uh, the outcome of our discussions will also contribute to advancing democracy and the rule of law through freedom of expression. Because freedom of expression is a precondition for democracy and the rule of law, as we were reminded during these last two days. Freedom of expression helps humanity to maintain diversity and plurality which are requirement of a democratic society. We live in a diverse society in terms of nationality, ethnicity, religion, ideology, lifestyle, and so on. And since modern democracy 
is and must be pluralist. It requires the coexistence of different and often conflicting ways of life, ideas, and ideologies. The freedom of expression is an effective instrument in of nurturing and maintaining such diverse and pluralistic values. It is also true that democracy and the rule of law require a free public sphere of exchange in which everybody must be able to participate by expressing their opinion. Only through a free expression of our ideas on certain issues, we can participate in decision-making processes, especially on those issues that are dear to us. Dear friends, brothers and sisters in humanity, I would not like to take much of your time, and therefore I would simply conclude my uh, remarks today by saying that uh, what is most urgent is to ensure that the AIDLR and its national chapter from now onward try to implement through concrete action what came out from these last two days' discussion including, and as I said earlier, we need to provide training uh, to members of the national chapters of the AIDLR. And I hope that the many experts around here will agree to give part of their time whenever they are called, be it in Germany, be it in Switzerland, and hopefully, soon I wish, in my own country, Senegal, and I was saying to Ganun that uh, we will organize a half day or a one day workshop so around the same topic. And I would encourage you also, each of you, when you go back home, try to organize even a half a day workshop, even a two hour workshop, whatever. It doesn't cost much just to share with your constituencies uh, the, uh, what you have taken from this meeting. And uh, we have to be re bear in mind that also we are living in a time in which, uh, in an era, I would say, of profound uh, technological changes. Telecom companies have a responsibility to our common humanity. And when they become willing accomplices in censorship and repression, unauthorized personal data sharing, they also become guilty of the very crimes that we condemn from those authorities. But also it is important that while safeguarding the freedom of expression, these tech companies should ensure that their platforms are not used to amplify bigot and hate or endanger lives of its users. Freedom of expression can only be nurtured when technological spaces are used to advance common good by encouraging and promoting respectful discourse among competing views while upholding privacy of its members, especially when such information may be used to harm individuals. Tech companies owe it to all of us to exercise this enormous power as fairly and transparently as possible. And as I said yesterday, we don't need draconian laws. We don't to uh, suppress hate speech. What we need is more speech. We need more speech. And when I said more speech, that means we should not 
limit freedom of expression simply because of concern of hate speech. Because when it comes uh, to uh, uh, prohibit hate speech, we are talking about incitement, hate speech which could lead either to genocide, and it's already in the 1948 convention, or incitement, as we can see in the uh, 1965 uh, convention on discrimination. So it's already there, but we don't need to add any more, any international legislation regarding hate speech. And I made that very clear when uh, in 20, uh, 19, when Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched with this UN strategy to uh, address hate speech, many amb ambassadors came to me. They said, well, special advisor, we need to have a legislation. I said, no, we don't need any new international law uh, to regulate this issue. This issue will be dealt, and I think one of us mentioned it clearly, when he referred to the role of civil society. Actors like us, the AIDLR, actors like religious leaders, faith-based actors, we can uphold this important role by engaging the necessary required dialogue. <coughs> With this, once again, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Mercedes. And may the Almighty God bless all of us. May our efforts during these two days bear fruits. And may our families remain safe. We were all pain with what happened with the earthquake in Turkey. I said once again, it's very sad, but I hope it will also remind the leaders of this world that we are simply in transit on Earth and that everything can happen at any time. And let's think about it. Let's think about it. Let's make the faith for right a reality. Let's make the faith, Earth for faith a reality because we live in this global village which is today, unfortunately, in danger. No one would have think that one day extremists will invade the capital. No one would have believed that we will see today the uh, emerging of a new international, international of populists who are fueling tension. So let's pray together, brothers and sisters, Thank and have a safe return to your respective countries. May Allah bless all of us. Thank you, so much. Thank you Brother Adama. We are just finishing some, some closing information. Very quick. Um, first of all, we are not going to meet tomorrow in a bus, which is good, because each one of you, I hope, already knows when it's leaving. Mercedes, if not, in Mercedes will send you an email with your departure from the hotel. I have three requests from you. Uh, in fact, they are not requests. One request is, please, um, we have a right. We have been talking about rights. Uh, we have a right when we finish to receive a diploma of uh, participation. So please, at the secretariat finishing, receive your diploma. We would be happy to, to give it to you. But we also have duties, and I would like to request that each one of you using earphones could please give the earphone um, when we, we are at the exit. It's important that we do it, okay? because um, Gulbenkian deserves to receive them back. <laughs> they were so kind to, to lend it to us. And we also have freedoms. So, rights, duties, and freedoms. And I know that some of you were a little bit disappointed with the fact that we were going to the hotel and having less time for shopping. In the morning, it was the opposite. 
So, um, as an organization, we try to fit everybody. We are learning about freedom of expression, and we have to give people freedom of shopping, too. So, we have a second bus, smaller one, that will go directly, Francesca, okay, Italian people, that will go directly to the shopping mall. And the main bus, the bigger one, will go to the hotel, okay? So, whoever from here wants to take the smaller bus to the shopping mall, uh, we'll, we'll take the smaller bus. So um, I said that, right? <laughs> the smaller bus, the shopping mall. The big bus to the hotel. And then we'll fit everybody. It's so easy. Why cannot do it in, in the world? So please um, keep that in mind. Thank you for participating. Uh, you will receive your departure time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Javier, for, for making that notice. We will depart from the hotel with a big bus to the restaurant. We will depart from 6 o'clock. At the most, we'll wait until 6.10, because there will be traffic at that time. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much.